Hi class and welcome to the video lecture for chapter 6 on health services financing. In this video I'll briefly be going over chapter 6, however I will not be going through the PowerPoint presentation in its entirety since it's a pretty long PowerPoint presentation. However, you are responsible for going through the full PowerPoint presentation as well as reading the chapter. The reason the PowerPoint presentation is so long for this chapter and other chapters is because I include so much detail so you can use it kind of as a study guide along with the textbook. All right, so let's get started. We'll begin with the learning objectives for this chapter. The first one is to study the role of healthcare financing and its impact on the delivery of healthcare to understand the basic concept of insurance and how general insurance terminology applies to health insurance, uh, to differentiate between group insurance, self-insurance, individual health insurance, managed care, high deduct deductible plans with savings, and Medigap, to explore trends in employer-based health insurance, to examine distinctive features of public insurance programs, to understand the various methods of reimbursement and developing trends, to discuss national health care and personal health care expenditures and trends in private and public financing, to become familiar with the requirements of the Affordable Care Act and their likely effects on financing and insurance, and to assess current directions and issues in health care financing. Here we are, slide five. So in broad terms, Financing includes the concepts of financing, insurance, and payment. In basic terms, financing enables people to obtain health insurance. The payment function determines reimbursement and undertakes the actual payment for services received by the insured. The key impact of financing is in determining access to health care services. Thus, the demand for health care is directly related to its financing. Increased demand means greater utilization of health services given adequate, given adequate supply. Financing also influences supply side factors, so this includes how much healthcare is produced. Health service managers are typically guided by demand, demand side factors, including reimbursement and evaluating what type of services to offer. Management decisions such as acquisition of new equipment, renovation or expansion of facilities, and launching of new programs are also heavily influenced by the amount of reimbursement needed to recoup the capital costs over time. New technology is rapidly developed and disseminated when it is a covered service. Similarly, new services proliferate when private insurance plans or Medicare start paying for them. Financing eventually affects the total health care expenditures incurred by the health delivery system. So um, insur insurance lowers out-of-pocket costs, and the higher utilization of health care services are known as moral hazards. So in the next slide, it's actually a video. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it's by Healthcare Triage and it covers um, the Rand Health Insurance Experiment and this concept of moral hazard. So in the next couple of slides, um, it'll kind of include more information on what I just touched on regarding um, health service financing. And I think there's a couple of slides on cost control. And now I want to jump to insurance. All right. So insurance is a mechanism for protection against risk. The possibility of a substantial financial loss from an event of which the probability of occurrence is relatively small, at least given an individual case, right? And there are four principles of insurance. These are the, um, the fundamental principles. So one is that risk is unpredictable for the individual insured. Second is the risk can be predicted with a reasonable degree of accuracy for a group or a population. Insurance provides a mechanism for transferring risk from the individual to the group through the pooling of resources. 
and fourth, actual losses are shared on some equitable basis by all insured members. So the insured, also known as the beneficiary, is really anyone that's covered under a particular health insurance plan. So there are two types of employer-sponsored plans. You have the single coverage plan and the family co coverage plan, which includes the spouse and the children. And here we are with more health insurance concepts. A premium is the amount charged by the insurer to insure against specified risks. Premiums are determined by the actuarial assessment of risk. Services covered by an insurance plan are referred to as benefits. Covered and non-covered services are included in a contract. So almost all plans include medical and surgical services, hospitalizations, emergency services, prescriptions, and maternity care and delivery. So services such as eyeglasses or routine dental care may or may not be covered depending on the plan. Services most commonly excluded are those that are those not ordered by a physician, such as self-care and over-the-counter products. Other services commonly excluded from health insurance coverage are cosmetic and reconstructive surgery, work-related illness and injuries, which are usually covered under the workers' compensation, uh, rest cures, genetic counseling, things of that nature. Employers and employees generally share in the cost of premiums. So in addition, the insured pays out-of-pocket expenses referred to as deductibles and co-payments or co-insurance. A deductible paid annually is the amount the insured must first pay before benefits by the plan are payable. And then you have your co-payment, which is the flat amount the insured must pay each time health services are received. And I'm sure you're all very familiar with both concepts, um, but just to make sure. And health plans may also use coinsurance, which is a set proportion of the medical costs that the insured must pay out of pocket. Now, I know that I went through the concepts, concepts of premium, covered costs, and cost sharing. And I just want to quickly just point out the difference between experience rating and community rating. So in experience rating, premiums are based on a group's own medical claims experience. Under this method, premiums differ from group to group because different groups have different risks. Now, when we're looking at community rating, it spreads the risk among members of a large community and, it's, and establishes premiums based on the utilization experience of the whole community. In this case, good risks subsidize poor risks. In other words, cost is shifted from people in poor health to those that are healthy. All right, so the next slide goes through deductible and co-payment, which we've already went over. And then really quick on slide 19 on insurance concepts. So here it's just talking about health insurance plans. We went over what a service plan is. It provides specified services to the insured, um, which means that it pays the hospital and physician directly. Um, again, except for the deductible and the co-payment. And then you have the indemnity plan, which is the reimbursement to the insured. And this is without regard to the expenses actually incurred um, so no relationship between the insurer and the provider. Then we have the covered services. We have our benefits, which are services that are covered under our insurance plan. And then the pre-existing conditions, which is a health problem that a person has prior to obtaining health insurance. Again, the ACA or the Affordable Care Act actually enabled persons with pre-existing conditions to enroll for insurance. All right, so now I'm gonna to jump to slide 22 and just briefly uh, just go over the six main types of private health insurance options available to Americans. So we have our group insurance, which is a plan obtained through an employer, a union or a professional, um, a professional organization. Uh, the risk is spread over the entire group. Then we have self-insurance, 
So self-insurance is an option chosen by many large employers who can generally predict their medical expenditures from year to year. Rather than pay insurers a premium to bear the risk, large employers can simply assume the risk of budgeting a certain amount to pay medical claims incurred by their employees. Self-insurance gives employers a greater degree of control over their health insurance costs. Um, and it is also exempt from several government regulations. Now, individually purchased private health insurance is an option available to the self-employed, the family farmer, the recent college graduate, the early retiree, the employee of a business that does not offer health insurance. So the individual private insurance determines premium price and eligibility based on the risk indicated by each individual's health status and demographics. Then we have managed care plans. And this is when we're talking about HMOs and PPOs um, that assume responsibility for the functions of the financing, insurance, payment, and delivery. Next, we have high deductible health plans, um, which combine a savings option with a health insurance plan carrying a high deductible. So the premiums are lower than in other types of plans. Savings options give consumers greater control over how to use their funds. An, H, an HRA is funded solely by the employer. An HSA is established by the individual and is largely funded by the individual and the account belongs to the individual. Last, Medigap. So Medigap is a private health insurance available only to Medicare beneficiaries to cover mainly the cost sharing expenses not covered by Medicare. So that covers the main types of health insurance, private health insurance. And next I'm going to be jumping to COBRA, which is I think slide 30. So COBRA stands for Consolidated Omnibus Budget Reconciliation, Reconciliation Act. Um, it was actually formally uh, enacted in 1986 and was a wide-ranging law dealing with many different issues. One of the most important issues was reform of employer-sponsored health care. According to the Department of Labor, COBRA requires continuation coverage to be offered to covered employees, their spouses, their former spouses, and their dependent children when group health coverage would otherwise be lost due to certain specific events. So you might be wondering who's eligible. Um, first off, it depends on the employer health plan. Um, it actually must be covered under Co COBRA. If the employer is a private sector employer, a state government or local government employer, and the employer employs at least 20 employees. So there are special rules to calculate this number. Next is um, regarding a qualifying event must occur. So qualifying events for an employee include termination of employment, unless it is a result of gross misconduct, and a reduction in work hours that leads to loss of coverage. So a reduction in hours, for example, from a full-time to part-time could lead to loss of insurance coverage. Because the employer doesn't provide coverage for part-time employees. And last, um, you must be a qualified beneficiary. So a qualified beneficiary is simply someone who was covered by their employer-sponsored health plan on the day before the qualifying event occurred, causing the loss of coverage. A qualified beneficiary can be an employee, a spouse, former spouse, or dependent child of the beneficiary. All right, so now I'm going to jump to um, Medicare. I think it's on slide 42 since we've already reviewed uh, COBRA. So let me jump really quick here. All right, so here we are covering Medicare Part A. Um, this is Medicare Part A hospital insurance um, and kind of like an overview of the benefits. So Part A, again, is the hospital uh, insurance portion of Medicare, and it's financed by special payroll taxes collected for um, collected for Social Security. The hospital insurance trust fund is financed by a payroll tax from the employee 
about 1.45% from the employee and 1.45% from the employer. All income is taxed, so a deductible applies per benefit period. A benefit period is a spell of illnesses beginning with hospitalization and ending when a beneficiary has not been an inpatient in a hospital or a skilled nursing facility for 60 consecutive days. Part A covers hospital inpatient services care, that services, care in a skilled nursing facility, or SNF, um, home health visits, and hospice care. Now, you might be wondering, what is covered? Well, um, a maximum of 90 days of inpatient hospital care is allowed per benefit period. Once the 90 days are used up, there's a lifetime reserve of 60 hospital inpatient days. There's no limit to the number of benefit periods. Okay, so beneficiaries must pay a deductible, and then the first 60 days are without any copayments. Up to 100 days of care in a Medicare certified skilled nursing facility are also allowed, uh, provided that the beneficiary has been hospitalized for at least three consecutive days, not including the day of discharge. Admission of, uh, admission to the skilled nursing facility must occur within 30 days of the hospital discharge and a copayment applies for the first 20 days. Home health care is covered when a person is homebound and requires intermittent or part-time part skilled nursing care or rehabilitation care. No cost sharing applies. For terminally ill patients, Medicare pays for care provided by a Medicare surf, uh, certified hospital, hospice. So the non-covered services are long-term care with the exception of that limited time in a skilled nursing facility um, care, as we've already, as I've already described, uh, custodial services and personal convenience services. This includes televisions, telephones, private duty nurses, private rooms that are not medical, medically necessary. Now let's jump to part B. Now part B is the supplementary medical insurance portion of Medicare. It's a voluntary program financed partly by general tax revenues and partly by required premium contributions from the enrollees. So as of 2007, premiums are means tested. There is an actual, there is an actual um, annual deductible and 80 to 20 coinsurance. So the main services covered by the supplementary medical insurance are outpatient services such as physician services, hospital outpatient services, outpatient surgery, uh, diagnostic testing, radiology, uh, emergency department visits, outpatient rehabilitation services, uh, renal dialysis, prosthesis, medical equipment and supplies, annual exams, and any really array of preventative services. Non-covered services include dental care, hearing aids, eyeglasses, um, except for cataract surgery, and services not related to treatment or injury. Now for Part C, or Medicare Advantage, um, it does not add specifically defined new services. Okay, it merely provides some additional choices of health plans with the objective of channeling a greater number of beneficiaries into managed care plans. So the Balanced Budget Act, BBA, of 1997 authorized that the Medicare Plus Choice Program, which took effect in 1998. So um, it took effect in 1998 and Medicare Plus Choice is actually Medicare Advantage. It was renamed um, through the passage of the MMA of 2003. So beneficiaries can either choose to enroll in a managed care plan or remain in the original Medicare fee-for-service program. Medicare Advantage plans may offer additional benefits that are not offered by the original Medicare plan and or may have lower pocket costs or lower out-of-pocket costs. All right, so next I want to cover Medicare Part D. So I'm going to jump to slide 45. 
And here we are. So Part D, is Part D of Medicare is voluntary. It requires payment of a monthly premium by those who want the coverage. The program is available to anyone regardless of income who has, regardless of income. So who has coverage under Part A or Part B. Coverage is offered through two types of private plans. You have your standalone prescription drug plans that offer only drug coverage are available to those who want to stay in the original Medicare fee-for-service program. And you have the Medicare Advantage prescription drug plans, which are available to those who want to obtain all healthcare services through managed care organizations participating in Part C. So that kind of gives you an overview of the Medicare Part D, and here provides a little more information, which I just went over. Now, the next slide does give you links to videos covering um, Medicare, uh, an overview of Medicare, as well as an overview of the Medicare Advantage. Next, we're going to talk about Medicaid. So let me jump to slide 49 here. So Medicaid is a federally and state funded program. It's administered by each individual state and it provides government insurance for people of any age whose incomes are insufficient to pay for health care. Medicaid helps to provide millions of Americans with important health care, especially children with disabilities, seniors and pregnant women. So Medicaid provides mandatory and optional benefits. Examples of these benefits include inpatient and outpatient hospital services, nursing facility services, early and periodic screening, diagno uh, screening diagnostics and treatment services to provide preventative health care for children under the age of 21. Er, um, physician services are also covered as well as laboratory and x-ray services. So that kind of gives you a gist of um, what Medicaid is all about. It is also referred as the Title 19 of the Social Security Act, and really it was originally designed to finance healthcare services for the indigent. Um, it's almost entirely a taxpayer financed program. And you might be wondering who is eligible. So families with children receiving support under the temporary assistance for needy families program, uh, people receiving supplemental security income, which includes many, includes many of the elderly, the blind, and the disabled with low incomes, and then children and pregnant women whose family income is at or below 133% of the federal poverty level. And the dual eligible, uh, eligible beneficiaries, the full duals, they actually qualify, qualify for all benefits under both Medicare and Medicaid. So that's how you have that. Now regarding the, regarding Medicaid and the Affordable Care Act. So that's what kind of, oh, okay. Here's the eligibility. Um, and then I wanted to touch on Medicaid and, um, how the Affordable Care Act actually impacted, uh, Medicaid. All right, so the Affordable Care Act had authorized the Department of Health and Human Services, or DHHS, to withhold the federal share of financing as a penalty for the states that refused to expand Medicaid. The U.S. Supreme Court struck down this mandate, and consequently, states now have a choice to either expand or not expand their Medicaid programs without any penalty from the federal government. The ASA requires coverage for legal residents under the age of 65 with income up to 138% of the FPL or federal poverty level. States can no longer use the assets, the assets test. Uh, federal matching was provided at 100% for the newly el eligible individuals for three years. And those three years were years 2014 to 2016, with a gradual reduction each year to 90% in 2020. So for beneficiary beneficiaries who were already in the Medicaid program, coverage for preventative services is at the discretion of the state. States have the option to establish health homes not to be confused with home health care for Medicaid beneficiaries who have chronic condition conditions, and this includes serious and persistent mental health conditions. All right, so that just provides uh, you all with some information on how Supreme Court's ruling on the ACA impacted Medicaid. 
Uh, next, I want to jump to slide 61, which just briefly, it's a table that distinguishes between Medicare and Medicaid. So really quick, Medicare, federal program that provides health coverage if you are 65 or older or have a severe di disability, no matter your income. Uh, Medicaid, it's for state and federal, well, it's a state and well, oh my, sorry. It's a state and federal welfare program to assist indigent with their medical needs. Dental care is limited. Um, the entitlement program, it, right to enforce in federal court their eligibility, that's regarding Medicare. And Medicare beneficiary with low income may receive help from Medicaid, which will pay for premiums and deductibles. When we're talking about Medicaid, we have Medicaid beneficiaries that cannot enforce their rights for eligibility. So they don't have that same um, aspect to that government program. And Medicaid may pay premiums of Part A and Part B for those that qualify. Next, we are talking about CHIP, the Children's Health Insurance Program. So back in 19, 1997, the Children's Health Insurance Program was created with strong bipartisan support. Uh, this Children's Health Insurance Program is also known as CHIP, gives states financial support to expand publicly funded coverage to uninsured children who are not eligible for Medicaid. As a block grant, CHIP provides states with a set amount of funding that must be match, matched with state dollars. So the Children's Health Insurance Program Reauthoriz Reauthorization Act reauthorized CHIP in April of 2009, and the 2010 Affordable Care Act contained provisions to strengthen this program. So the ACA extended CHIP funding until September 30th of 2015 and required states to maintain eligibility standards through September 30th of 2019. So the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act, also known as MACRA, of 2015 extended CHIP funding with no programmatic changes through September 30th of 2017. CHIP also builds on Medicaid success providing health coverage to children since 1965. States can use their federal CHIP funds to finance coverage for children whose family incomes are too high to qualify for Medicaid under the rules of the state, um, under the rules the state had in place as of June 1997. Now, regarding financing, federal and state governments jointly finance CHIP. Although the federal government assumes a larger share of the financing with an enhanced federal matching rate, ranging from 65 to 82 percent. So that kind of gives you an idea of what the Children's Health Insurance Program is all about. Next, I want to talk about the military health system. So, oops, sorry. Um, I, on slide 66, you will find links to a video on the, men's, the military health uh, service system and uh, that just provides an overview of it. And, um, and I just wanted to briefly go over it right now and just go over the provisions that has the federal government that the gov federal government has made. Um, providing health care to military personnel and to vet veterans of the U.S. Armed Forces. So the health care program for military personnel, their dependents, survivors, and retirees is operated by the Department of Defense, or DOD. Each of the military departments, being Army, Navy, and Air Force, they all, um, they op these departments operate it, their own medical faci facilities. So TRICARE is the insurance arm of military health care. Then you have the VHA, which operates the largest integrated health care system in the United States. So the VHA has over 1,700 sites, the Veterans Health Administration, throughout the nation. Both service-related and non-service-related conditions are treated on a priority basis. Veterans with service-connected illnesses and disabilities, low incomes, or special health care needs receive top priority. More than half of the veterans serviced by VHA have no service-connected disabilities. Funding for the VHA program is appropriated in the annual presidential budget approved by Congress, 
The structure of the VHA funding is patterned after the global budget model, in which budget appropriations are determined in advance for the entire system. The VHA then distributes the funds to its original organizational units having oversight for the delivery of healthcare. So the Veterans Health Administration or the VHA also operates the Civilian Health and Medical Program of the Department of Veterans Affairs, which covers dependents of permanently and totally disabled veterans. And the VHA shares the cost of covered healthcare services and supplies with eligible beneficiaries. Since we went through the Veterans Health Administration um, and kind of went over that, now I'd like to touch on the Indian Health Service. So the Indian Health Service is an agency within the Department of the DHHS, and it's responsible for providing federal health services to American Indians and Alaska Natives. The provisions of health services to federally recognized Indians grew out of a special relationship between the federal government and the Indian tribes. This government to government relationship is based on Article 1, Section 8 of the United States Constitution and has been given form and substance by numerous treaties, laws, Supreme Court decisions, and executive orders. Now, it again provides comprehensive health care services directly to the members of the federally recognized American Indian and Alaska Native tribes, as well as their descendants. And it serves about 1.9 million American Indians and Alaska Natives residing on or near reservations. Now, the services that it includes, it includes a health promotion and disease prevention um, programs, as well as programs in substance abuse, maternal and child health, sanitation and nutrition and there is a video that there's a link found on slide 72 that covers the history of the Indian Health Service if you're interested view it and I'm thinking I have it in the module as well now I'm going to jump to slide 77 talking about reimbursements I just wanted to cover the major methods of reimbursement for outpatient services. So the following main methods are used for reimbursement of outpatient services. The first one is fee-for-service reimbursement, which pays a separate amount for each identifiable and individually distinct unit of service. As or examples of this include um, an examination, x-ray, tetanus shot, things of that nature. So each of these services is separately itemized on one bill, and there can be more than one bill if different providers are involved. Due to its perverse financial incentives, the fee-for-service method has been largely discontinued. Now, charges may be based on a set of bundled services. So this is where we go to package prices, pricing, or bundled payments. And an example of this would be a normal vaginal de delivery may have one set fee that includes the procedure and pre- and post-delivery care. Optometrists sometimes advertise package prices um, that include the charges for an eye exam, frames for glasses, as well as corrective lenses. Now, the next method we have listed is RBRVS, or reimbursement based on a resource-based relative value scale. And it's used by Medicare to reimburse physicians according to a relative value assigned to each physician service. Relative values take into account the time, skill, and intensity it takes to provide a service. Each year, Medicare establishes a conversion factor. Reimbursement equals the relative value units for a service multiplied by the conversion factor. So there are three main payment approaches used under the various managed care approaches. Okay, so when we're covering the managed care approaches, the approaches, there are three main payment approaches. The first one is the preferred provider approach, which may be regarded as a variation of the fee-for-service approach. The main distinction, though, is that a managed care organization establishes fee schedules based on discounts negotiated with providers. Now, another approach under managed uh, care approaches includes um, undercapitation 
a set monthly fee per enrollee is actually paid to the provider. And it's also known as the PMPM rate. Now, all services rendered by the provider are covered under the capitated fee. And the last one for the managed care approaches um, is the, when the salary is combined with productivity bonuses. Okay. And then we have the ambulatory payment classification system, which is a prospective payment method used for paying hospital outpatient departments by Medicare. Rates are established for established for each ambulatory payment classification category based on the median cost of services within the ambulatory payment classification or APC. So the reimbursement rates are adjusted for geographic variation in wages. And the APC reimbursement is a bundled rate that includes services such as anesthesia, um, certain drugs, supplies, and recovery room charges in a packaged price established by Medicare. Now, that covers the last one, which is the cost plus reimbursement. I do want to quickly, just very uh, briefly, cover the retrospective and prospective methods of reimbursement. Now, before I go through the differences between the retro retrospective and prospective methods, um, I wanted, since I covered the managed care approaches, I know it is uh, included here, it's on slide 83, just so you know what I'm talking about when I was going through that. Last was the cost plus reimbursement, um, and then, which is a type of retrospective reimbursement. And then I'm going to jump to um, this idea of prospective reimbursement and retrospective. So there are two types. And I just want you to have it in your mind and understand the differences between the both, between both. So first with retrospective, it's a reimbursement that's based on actual costs incurred in the past. So in other way, in other words, cost evaluated retrospectively. So this includes the total reimbursement that's directly related to the length of stay, services rendered, and the cost of providing the services. Um, providers that have an incentive to increase costs and not be sensitive to the need for efficiency and cost containment in the delivery of services. Um, and it also includes, includes cost increases generally become essential for maximizing reimbursement and profits. So that kind of gives you an idea of retrospective reimbursement. Now, when we're talking about prospective, um, we're talking about certain pre-established criteria, not costs, and they're used to determine in advance the amount of reimbursement. Reimbursement is related to resource inputs, um, and because of the fixed reimbursement, providers have an incentive to reduce costs and provide services more efficiently. And uh, a lot of times cost increases generally lead to a loss to be absorbed by the provider. So these are just kind of, just to kind of give you an idea of the differences between both and just a little information on them. Now, I'm kind of skimming through my PowerPoint presentation. I didn't see a slide on retrospective reimbursement. I'm, I have a feeling I'm overlooking it, but just make sure to read that section in the chapter. Now going into a little more detail regarding prospective reimbursement, the next slide includes uh, types of prospective reimbursement. And I specifically wanted to kind of go through a little more detail on prospective payment systems under DRGs or diagnosis related groups. Now, the prospective payment system under DRGs is used by Medicare to determine acute care hospital inpatient reimbursement. The primary factor governing the amount of reimbursement is the type of case, but additional factors can create differences in reimbursement from the same DRG. Now, the DRG-based rates are adjusted for geographic differences in wages and location of the hospital in urban versus rural areas, uh, teaching hospitals, 
and disproportionate share hospitals that serve a large number of poor people. Additional payments are also made for cases that involve extremely long hospital stays or extremely expensive, which are referred to as outliers. So since we've went through prospective um, reimbursement in relation to DRGs, the next topic I kind of wanted to briefly go over are um, really the difference between national health expenditures and personal health expenditures, which is found on slide 99. So national health expenditures estimate the amount spent for all health services and supplies and health-related research and construction activities consumed in the U.S. during a calendar year. In addition, costs incurred in the administration of private and public health insurance and spending on public health activities are included. Now, when we're talking about personal health expenditures, they're confined to services and goods related directly to patient care. So more specifically, personal health expenditures constitute the amount remaining after expenditures for research and construction, administrative expenses incurred in health insurance programs, and costs of government public health activities have been subtracted from national health expenditures. So services include hospital care, um, physician services, dental care, other professional services, nursing home care, home health care, uh, drugs, non-durable products, durable medical equipment, vision care, and really other um, personal health care. Now, if you'd like to see the trends in private and public expenditures, that is found in Chapter 6. So that pretty much wraps it up for the Chapter 6 video lecture. I just kind of wanted to briefly go over it, but it is a very um, extensive chapter. There's a lot of information there, and I just wanted to keep the time frame of this video lecture somewhat realistic. However, make sure to read the chapter, review this PowerPoint presentation again in its entirety. It is long, but I have included a lot of detail, uh, more detail than I would in a usual PowerPoint presentation to make it easier for you to understand the concepts. Now, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to reach out to me. Best of luck, everyone. Take care.